Well, let's uh, read the scriptures together. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 17. And we're continuing from last fall, I guess. Uh, and we'll have uh, Acts finished by the end of the summer. And our theme has been witnesses to the ends of the earth. And this morning we move into a place called Thessalonica and Berea. They're around the Aegean Sea and uh, two places that Paul went to. And uh, we are back into the second missionary journey of Paul. Uh, so let me uh, read the this, this scripture to us. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphilius and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined uh, Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar, Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others postpone and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if Paul, what Paul said was true. And as a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. But when the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, some of them went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Those who escort, escorted Paul brought him to Athens, and then they left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, just bless us now as we uh, meditate upon it, understand it, open uh, our minds and our hearts up by your Holy Spirit, we pray. And Lord, we just thank you for the life and journey of Paul and that the early church and the planting of churches and planting of leaders and so many people that uh, it just overwhelmed really the Roman Empire because they turned the world upside down at that time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this scripture is a continuation of Paul's second missionary journey that happened between 49 and 52 A.D., he and Silas had set off from Antioch. They traveled across Asia Minor, revisiting the churches that Paul and Barnabas had established during the first missionary journey. And in Lystra, young Timothy joined them on the journey as well. And after many attempts to take the gospel north, Paul received a, a vision from a man of Macedonia begging him to come to help them. Going on to Macedonia, the city of Philippi, Paul and his group taught and converted Lydia, a jailer, and their households. And it just so happened that Paul gets thrown out of that particular city. You know you're doing the work of God effectively when you get thrown out of a city. All right? And, and to understand what happens, I mean, that as he, he comes and he sees these people in Philippi come to Christ... And he's very clear about that. And uh, 
that the magistrates release them and, and off they go to the next place. There's lots of places to visit and lots of places to minister. Paul heads to the port city of Thessalonica, which is now the modern day city of Thessaloniki, Greece. Paul would have traveled around a, a highway by the, na- by the name of Via Agnesia from Philippi to Thessalonica. It was a, a 1120 kilometer or 696 mile highway, that road system that connected a string of Roman colonies. Uh, it was an amazing road. It was about, I guess, as wide as my street on Iroquois Crescent, two lanes at least. And it was uh, made with large polygonal slabs, stone slabs covered with a hard layer of sa- uh, sand. In fact, the, some of those roads are still in existence today. That's how well built they were. And, uh, and so Paul ventures on this. And uh, they go. As he comes to this particular city, he does what he always tries to do. You have to understand that because of Paul's background, being a Pharisee, he was, in a sense, a a resident theological uh, kind of professor. And he goes into these towns and finds uh, the nearest synagogue because of his credentials, they would let him in to speak. And so he goes into this synagogue. And notice here, uh, in these first few verses, and especially in light of the, these first nine verses, we see here the priorities of a preacher. And uh, Paul comes into Thessalonica, a very well-to-do city, goes to the synagogue, and look at verse 2. It just says here, as it was his custom, he goes into the synagogue on these three Sabbath, Sabbath days. So three weeks in a row, he was the guest speaker there. And he, it says here that he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, this Greek word particularly is a, a unique word. It doesn't say that he got mad at them. It doesn't say they got, he got angry with them. It says he reasoned or dialogued with them. He would share the scriptures with them. And in that particular synagogue, like other synagogues, they would have copies of the book of Isaiah and a number of the books of the Old Testament. He could just say, well, do you know what it says in Isaiah 9 or Isaiah 32? And he he would just be able to pick up a scroll and read it to them and explain it to, to them as well. And then, you know, he would dialogue with them, ask questions. There was no cancel culture back then. Paul just explained the gospel. And it it says here very clearly, he explained and proved that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. And so Paul, having such an incredible mind about the Old Testament scriptures, would prove to them from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And that was the whole thing that he did. And like a good pastor, he wanted to explain the gospel to them very clearly. That Jesus Christ came as God's son. That Jesus came as the Messiah, the only Savior that we could have. That Jesus would die on the cross for our sins and he was buried. And then he rose again to give us life and he would give Vincing proof, one after another, that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. In fact, he would quote Jesus. He likely had enough people that were traveling with him that also saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And as, they, as he explained the gospel and he proved the gospel, what he did was point people to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. That's what an effective preacher does points people to Jesus Christ. You might be here this morning, and maybe you've heard the gospel many times, but you've never responded to the gospel of Jesus. You've never really put your faith and trust in him. Your parents might be Christians. Your grandparents might be Christians, followers of Jesus, but you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
And Paul did it with urgency because he didn't really know how, how long he would have in a certain town, right? But he wanted people to understand. And I'm sure that after the kind of the second or the third week, people were saying, he keeps preaching the same message. Keeps preaching the same message. Why? Because he wanted to see people respond to the message of the gospel of Christ. He would give an invitation that today, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because we don't know how long we have. And you could just hear him preaching the gospel in that particular synagogue. And then what happens is amazing. See, people respond to the gospel when it's clearly explained and where people have time to dialogue with the gospel. Because as they start to understand, especially these Jewish people who were there, they were longing for the Messiah. But just like every synagogue that Paul shows up to, there are these God-fearing people that are there. Different nationalities, Greeks, and different people that live there, they're, they're searching for God too. And, and, and Paul is preaching to them, and not only do Jewish people come to know Christ here, but it says here that a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women as well. That's important to understand because the, the synagogue was such a male, patriarchal-centered place. But women also came to Christ too because men and women come to Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ? This morning, do you know him as your Lord and Savior? And Gwen mentioned that this week we, we've been ministering to a, a number of different people. And, and um, people with no hope, no hope at all. And some have found hope this week through Jesus Christ. And all over the world today, there will be preachers, fa faithful preachers, they're not online. They're not on television. They're in some of the most remotest places on the earth. They are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are people coming to Christ today all over the world because of the faithful preaching of the gospel. That Jesus lives. Jesus is coming again. Jesus died for you. Jesus shed his blood for you for all of your sin. That Jesus rose again from the dead so that you can have resurrection life. You do not have to live this life without hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. He's our peace. He's our joy. He's the one that we can love because he first loved us. Don't be confused that you think that you can get to heaven on your own merit or on your own goodness. I've been with enough of you to know that you're not that good. I'm not that good. There are no good people in heaven. There are only godly people in heaven who've been transformed by Jesus Christ. It's very easy for us who are, you know, have a job, we have a family, we might have a house, we have all this thing, and we can, we can point out the fools in our culture, Right? Fools don't want to have anything to do with God. We can point out those who are evil in our culture. But there's a lot of people that are good people within our culture. But they do not know Jesus Christ. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father except through him. So we have to say goodbye to our goodness. And trust Christ and repent of our sin and turn to him alone. And Christ moves into the heart. But notice something else here. People get jealous when Jesus is successful. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. When you go to the marketplace, guess what? There's bad characters there. They formed a mob, started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house. He was a follower of the Lord Jesus and, and some of his friends and, 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 and Paul and and, and his companions had already left by then. 
and uh, they had to postpone. They had to agree with the city officials that they wouldn't start any problems. They weren't the ones who started the problems. And, they, and in fact, they were seeing people's lives change. The world is into transition. Jesus Christ is into transformation. That's what he's all about. And when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. They made Jason and the others post a bond to let, and let them go. Basically, a bond at that time was if you post a bond, you agree that you're not going to upset us anymore. And so they go. And then they're off to Berea. So what are the priorities of a gospel preacher, you might say? Well, it's just very clear. They point people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They lift up Christ. They, they are able to, to just dialogue with people and have conversations with people. And they can explain it. They can lay it out for people. And they invite people to respond. But in your hearts, it says in 1 Peter 3.15, Revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, notice this, with gentleness and respect. Notice Jason and his friends didn't get all out of hand about it. They just responded. They were just going to live out their lives. All of us who know Christ are, are to point people to Jesus. And it's amazing how many people were persuaded and followed Jesus here. And yeah, opposition happens. There's jealousy over the success of Jesus changing lives. Why? Because what was Paul doing? He was saying that Jesus Christ is the king. And so there were a lot of people there who were followers of Caesar. Roman citizens who said, no, there's, there's only one divine presence, and that's Caesar. And, and Paul says, no, he's not divine. Jesus is the king of kings. And so when you talk about Jesus being the king and Lord of lords and the one that we're going to have to bow to, either being saved as a child of his, that we will bow the knee to him in awe and incredible worship, or those who reject Jesus Christ will have to bow to him, they will be full of dread because they will stand before him as their eternal judge. But Jesus is king. If they persecuted Jesus if they persecuted Peter, if they persecuted John, if they persecuted Paul, we can exp how can we expect any different? And one of the things that you see, what happens to all of these people, is that they really, when you come to Christ, you are rebelling against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what happens. And in 1 John 2.16, it says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Because Peter says, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And then James gives us such incredible advice to rebel against the world, the flesh, and the devil. He says, submit yourselves then to God, right? That Christ has to be Lord of your life. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Take our stand with Christ. Adrian Rogers, the pastor in the U.S., said this, It is better to be divided by truth than to be united in error. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. It is not love and it's not friendship if we fail to declare the whole counsel of God. It is better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. It is impossible to find anyone in the Bible who has a power for God who did not have enemies and was not hated at times. It's better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with a multitude. It is better to ultimately succeed with truth than temporarily succeed with a lie what are the priorities of a gospel preacher the gospel of jesus christ preaching christ paul and his friends leave and verse 10 says as soon as it was night the believers sent paul and silas away to berea 
Have you ever thought of that verse before? I mean, Paul and, 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 and Silas and the, their team, ministry team, is sent off. They are protected by other believers. And there are times where each one of us might need the protection of another believer because of the ministry we're doing. And that's what they did. They didn't leave them hanging out to dry. They just moved in such a way that they protected Paul and Silas, and they went away to Berea. Now, for, from Philippi to Thessalonica, it was about a 100 miles or so, kind of a three-day journey. Going from Thessalonica to Berea, uh, around the Aegean Sea, uh, this, this was maybe a long day's walk, about 54 kilometers, starting out in the morning and then heading out to that place. Notice something about the Bereans. They, were, they received the message of the gospel very openly. They were looking for hope. They were looking for the, what, what really was happening in, in, in the world. Maybe some people even got ahead of Paul and, and talked to them about the gospel. We don't know. But the Bereans received the message of the gospel. In fact, the Bereans searched the scriptures daily to fact check the Apostle Paul. Isn't that interesting? Uh, they took time every day after Paul was preaching and teaching them to make sure that Paul was preaching from the Word of God. He wasn't making things up. That They, they, they looked for the proofs. Uh, that's what made them more noble, you see. I mean, within our culture, we have people that are believing anything that anybody says online. And, and that's such a dangerous thing to be in. Because we miss out on the truth of God. And when the truth of God rules in our life, there is such true freedom and responsibility to do the right things that honor God. So here we see the priorities of the believers in Berea. They, they first of all, received, they listened to the gospel, they searched the scriptures to daily fact check the Apostle Paul, and, and, and we know that they basically were saying, well, what is God saying here? Is Paul really lining up with the things of God? He goes back to the synagogue, right? These are religious people. So they had an understanding of, of a lot of things. And there were also Greek women and Greek men who were part of that group as well, who were wanting to find out the truth. And when the truth is spoken, people know it in their hearts. Did you know that? Because when they are listening to error, they have to excuse their hearts because God has put his law on all of our hearts. And that stops us, I think, to understand when we're hearing lies and we're hearing things coming across the, the media waves, we have to fact check it with the Word of God. So a number of Bereans and Greek women and men believed. They had clear minds and open hearts. They, they, they in a sense, read their Bibles more than those in Thessalonica. And there's opposition that occurs as well. There's wind that is blowing. There's things that are happening, right? And they have to deal with all of it. And as Paul preaches to them, there are people that come to know Jesus. Can you imagine going to heaven someday because of your faith in Christ and you, got, you could just ask Jesus, hey, I, I just want to go spend some time with the Bereans. He knows where they are. They've been there a while already. Uh, I'd like to go visit Jason and some of his friends from Thessalonica. Jesus goes, oh yeah, they're just over here gathering. And they're all people that believers in Jesus Christ. And as Paul moves and ministers, once again, there's opposition from people in Thessalonica who hear that Paul is preaching in Berea. So they're following him around. 
trying to get rid of them. You know why? Because the gospel is changing too many people that they know. Then they're being forced to kind of really consider who Jesus Christ is as a result. And when you don't want to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to be in opposition to him. Jesus says you're either for me or against me. There's no in-between. You can't be neutral. You can't sit on the fence. You're either for him or against him. And these Jews and Jewish people came and agitated the crowds. They stirred them up as well. And the believers, once again, immediately sent Paul to the coast. And Paul left Silas and Timothy there at Berea. Why? Because Paul was not a one-man show, for one thing. And Paul was committed to the evangelist, to, to reach out and evangelize people that they come to know Jesus. But he wanted them to go deeper and become followers and true disciples of Jesus. So he leaves Silas and Timothy there, likely with some others at Berea, and, and for them just to continue to teach the people to follow Jesus no matter what. The priority of God's people are to hear the word of God, to accept the word of God, to believe in the word of God, to check out the preacher too, right? Do you check me out after Sunday? I hope you do. Right? Not to roast me at, at lunch. Okay? But what did the pastor say this morning? Was it according to the word of God? Or was he just making up stuff? Or was it about his dream last night? Or some vision? As he was driving down the highway? No, it has to be from the word of God. We have to check it out. Paul gives the invitation, right? And we're going to come around the Lord's table in just a few moments. And he gives the invitation because he knows Jesus is the only one who can save them. And the message of the gospel, right from the time of Jesus' resurrection, right to this particular day is still the same, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and for me, that he died, he was buried, and then he rose again, so that we can experience resurrection life right now and be part of his eternal kingdom because we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the eternal king. He's the only one that can transform our life. And the invitation today is still the same for you to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and then continue to grow in your walk and follow Him. What are the priorities for us resulting from this message? To be people who love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Allow the gospel every day to transform us. Allow Christ and His Holy Spirit to teach us through the Word so that His message can go forth. And as we sing this song before communion today, I just ask you and encourage you to just allow Jesus and His Holy Spirit to check your heart today. Because communion is such a good time for us to reflect on our life. Are we truly following Christ? Even in persecution, even in having to take a stand for Him no matter what. Jesus took the stand for us he took the cross for us. And so we worship in response to him today as followers of Jesus Christ. Communion, the Lord's table, is for the believer in Jesus Christ. It cannot save you. It's a remembrance of what Christ has done. And it's a time of reflection for us to see where we're at with God. And maybe there's something in your life, believer, that God has been pointing his finger to that you need to get right with him. And maybe there's things to get right in your family. I don't know what God's speaking to you about today, but the Spirit of God uniquely speaks to all of us if we're listening.
And so let him speak to you. And may you respond to him as we take the bread and the cup today. Let me just pray and I invite those that are serving with me today just to meet over here as we sing this last song. Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this example of Paul, Silas, and the team as they ministered the gospel of Jesus. Thank you for all those people that believed in you. And we just thank you, Father, for the opportunities that we have to, as well as we share Christ with those who have no hope. We bless you. We thank you as we prepare for the Lord's table today in Jesus' name. Amen.